Hello, my name is Sue Rofe. I'm Professor of Architectural Engineering at Heriot Watt University and we're making this video to try and help you think about new ways in which you can flood proof your own buildings and communities. This is because with climate change we're getting more and more extreme weather year on year. December this year was the coldest December on record for 366 years in the UK. April was the driest ever. And so being sensible, we'll have to think about ways we can reduce the risk of damage in our own lifestyles, in our homes and our offices over time. So we've come to Moray Council, to the city of Elgin, which is one of the most flooded cities in Britain to see if we can find out how they do it and learn from them. In order to look at flooding in more detail, we've come to Elgin in Moray, one of the most flood prone towns in Scotland, and we're going to meet Peter Haslam, who's director of the Moray Flood Alleviation Project, to find out how they're dealing with the project on the scale of the city. Well, Peter, thank you very much for talking to us today. We'd be really interested to hear what your position is in Murray Council, and then tell us about the sort of risks being experienced from flooding in Elgin at the moment. Hi, yeah, my, I'm Peter Haslam. I'm the project manager for Elgin Flood Alleviation Scheme. Risk in flooding is a combination of the probability of an event happening and the consequences of that event happening. With Elgin Flood Alleviation Scheme, we started work about the year 2000, and we investigated the three generic options that are usually considered when looking at flood prevention schemes. One was attenuation through uh, flood uh, dams, or storage dams, upstream of Elgin, uh, another was a diversion channel um, via the Spiny Canal. And the third and option, the one that we have chosen, uh, was initially called Walls and Embankments, but it's, uh, strictly speaking, it's a sustainable flood corridor that will go through Elgin. It will widen the watercourse from its natural channel with embankments principally and allow the flood water to expand into the floodplain but not completely take up the floodplain. Can you tell us what projects you've got actually ongoing in Moray to alleviate flood risk in the area? Yeah, we are looking at works on about three miles of the watercourse and the total cost of the works and the engin civil engineering works is about £50 million. Pounds. Wow, that's a, a lot of money. But um, the project's well underway now. I believe you've got the funding agreed by the Scottish Government. So I just wondered if you'd be ex kind enough to explain what the alleviation schemes will be like and, and how you're going to use them to protect the people of Elgin. Well, uh, go going through Elgin, we will be replacing some uh, bridges that are what you might call bottlenecks mm -hmm. with uh, bigger, bigger span bridges. And also in one particular location at Pansport, there will be a flood relief channel that will come into operation at about one in 50 years. Um, the rest, uh, the design itself is based upon one in 200 years, plus an allowance of 500 millimetres on the embankments, which is to, to allow water to stay in bank without overtopping the banks at the design standard. The reason that this is important is because if embankments do get overtopped, you can, this can lead to rapid erosion of the embankment and, and subsequently breaching so how many people or how many houses are this project going to, to save? The project is designed at one in 200 years to protect around 600 homes and in excess of 200 businesses. 
That's an awful lot. Were there always this many buildings that were at risk? No, uh, th this is, the buildings at risk have been developed uh, in, uh, over a period of um, perhaps the last two to three hundred years, uh, slowly in reaching the point now where um, there, are th there are too many buildings that are in what would be the River Lossie floodplain. So does that mean that, that there's any plans to pull the ones that are, are most at risk back from the floodplain in managed retreat? Not in Elgin. There are a few buildings that we will be demolishing in order to uh, widen the, the water course mm -hmm. and allow the water course to use some of the floodplain. So we will be taking down some homes and businesses, I think about five or six homes, and maybe 15 to 20 businesses, that, and all of the businesses will be relocated elsewhere within uh, industrial areas close by. And as most of the people watching this film are going to be developers or architects and builders, would you give us the benefit of your advice on how to protect buildings that are in the floodplain or are going to be built in the floodplain? The first thing I would recommend is don't build on a floodplain. <laughs> yeah, good advice. Um, and, and certainly we were talking earlier about pot the potential for managed retreat from a floodplain. Mm -hmm. And certainly um, where the, the risk of flooding is higher, you know, closer to a watercourse, then there's a good argument for a managed retreat from a floodplain such that uh, the housing development is more towards, if you like, the, the, the foothills type of uh, development, where people um, have a good reason to be in a floodplain. I think people who have to live in a floodplain, such as farmers and the like, then there's perhaps a, a good reason to look at areas where development can take place. I think if you look at um, old natural floodplains, you'll find that quite often the older houses are on little uh, old sand dunes or this type of thing. You'll often see old farmhouses on small hills within a floodplain. And they've probably been caused by um, wind uh, um, at some stage. Um, I, I don't know if you're familiar with this area. If you look at the floodplains here during uh, the, the springtime, the, the soils are very light, so they get blown about quite a lot. And so... Um, you get a point of eddy or something in a plain. Uh, yeah, you often see these, these small hills that are maybe two or three metres higher than the general flood plain itself. And that's a good place to build a house. What are the insurance implications of this project? Well, firstly, um, if people are looking to buy homes, mm. um, they can phone me up and I will write um, a report on uh, a, re a property explaining what the potential risk is at a property and what actions the council may be planning that may improve that risk or reduce that risk. I occasionally get questions from insurance companies about this too and I give them similar advice. We have flood risk maps uh, and we will be improving the quality of our flood risk mapping with the work that we are planning to do shortly under the 2009 Flood Risk Management Act. Uh, when we have finished schemes at, uh, at Lambride and in the Burn of Mosset in Forres, I have written to insurance companies, the Association of British Insurers, mm -hmm. and explained to them that we've carried out a project, we've finished it, and what the standard of defence th is that the project was designed to. Well, thank you very much, Peter. That's been absolutely fascinating. It'll be a great use to our viewers. So this is the apparently benign Lossy River that causes so much damage. 
Some thousand buildings are threatened by its flooding now. But the Moray Flood Alleviation Programme is going ahead now. Contracts have been signed. Buildings are being pulled down. You can see here trees have been taken down too. And within a short period, all of these industrial buildings will be demolished to extend the flood pain and build the new protective banks. So now let's go and meet David Gowans, who's going to tell us about the Scottish legislative framework within which all of this activity is happening. Well, David, thank you very much for coming in on your day off. And we'd be grateful if you'd tell us about the Scottish legislative framework on flooding that you've had a hand in developing. My role in, uh, in Elgin is uh, as project director for the Murray Flood Schemes, which is a £160 million pounds worth of uh, uh, flood protection work uh, across five communities in Murray. And we're, we're well through the programme now, um, but a lot still to do. Uh, I'm also chair of the Scottish Council's uh, flooding group. And, uh, and in that role, uh, I'm the council's representative on the Scottish Government's policy management group for the new flooding legislation, that's the Flood Risk Management Scotland Act of 2009. Now that act has uh, I mean, it's been a long time in coming and it, a couple of thrusts here is one is that Scotland had to implement the, the EC Floods Directive and bring it into Scots law uh, as all uh, member countries have to do. Uh, and secondly, ministers uh, wanted to try and, try and speed up the, the flow of flood schemes because the statutory processes were taking so long. Uh, I've been involved right through the implementation of the Act, uh, following on from advising government on the actual drafting of the Act in the first place. Uh, the Act itself is a framework. Um, it doesn't actually provide very much in the way of firm guidance as to how we take things forward. So the actual implementation is quite tricky and there's a lot of work going on just now with uh, through councils, through Scottish Water and SEPA uh, and Scottish Government uh, to provide the guidance and it's beginning to come out thick and fast now. Now it's going to change how we manage flooding. It changes the whole concept and the whole way of thinking. We've got to think on a catchment basis now. It's not, it's not just simply a case of treating the symptoms. We, we've got to look at the causes. Um, so that means looking at whole catchments. How can we slow down the flow? How can we better use floodplains? And ultimately, how can we defend our key assets? Uh, it looks at all forms of flooding, not just rivers. We have pluvial flooding from um, uh, storm events, uh, thunderstorms and so on, sewer flooding, and of course coastal flooding. And this Act combines all of these and, and makes us look at everything. The, the framework I, I'll try to explain as briefly as I can um, is where um, the, uh, there will be a flood risk assessment from SEPA that's based on uh, data that they can gather quickly and readily uh, or derive readily and they've been collecting a lot of information from local government and Scottish Water and from their own resources uh, to create flood maps of Scotland. Uh, they then have to carry out a flood hazard assessment of Scotland, which looks at water velocities and depths of flooding. And um, these will inform flood risk management planning areas. So, um, for example, you will have a flood risk management planning area on the size of the River Tay catchment, uh, and maybe slightly larger than that even, which will combine a number of authorities, Scottish Water, probably the Forestry Commission, uh, and uh, the and SEPA. There will be a national plan and a local plans which have to be developed, consulted upon during 2015 for implementation at the end of 2015 on a six year rolling, a uh, six year cycle I should say. Um, the plans have to be resourced and agreed by all of the parties involved so you may have eight authorities plus SEPA and Scottish Water all involved in one plan. So um, it's uh, exciting times ahead as we go forward and develop this and take a much more proactive approach to flooding. Do you think, can I, can I ask you here that we represent the sort of the, the built environment. Um, do you think that the people, the stakeholders there, the planners, developers, architects, builders, 
Do you think they have a, a, a good enough handle? Do you think that um, the interaction between you, the, the sort of flood experts and us out there in you know, sort of the buildings field is good enough? And, and what do you see the key bridge, would you say, for us to go to the SEPA website? Or do you think it's planning legislation? Or do you think that relationship's working? It's a complex subject. Mm. Uh, the situation is improving. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Um, it's much more difficult to obtain planning consent now for flood risk areas, for example. Mm. Uh, planning authorities are much tighter on that. And SEPA as a consultee are much tighter on it too. Um, it's a broad subject. We've got to look at flooding um, and how we deal with existing flood risk too, to existing properties. Mm. Um, the, the Act doesn't say we have to protect every property because resources are thin and we can't possibly protect everything. We have to look at uh, the resilience of properties. We have to look at acceptance of flooding, flood warning, all sorts of different tools that we can use to protect properties. And developers have to be conscious of all of these things. Um, one of the areas I would like to see uh, improved is that, for example, in Elgin, we've had properties which have several hundred properties that have flooded at least twice over the last 12 or 13 years. And each time they've been repaired and put back exactly as they are. Uh, and every time they're flooded, the damage is as bad as it was before. And the whole houses have to be gutted uh, and it's almost start from scratch. Um, it to me seems silly that uh, we don't b build them in a way that they're more resistant to flooding, stone floors and high electrics and so on. Um, now, of course, the insurance industry is withdrawing systematically um, insurance opportunities from high-risk houses. How, how are you going to deal in this community with that challenge? Because surely that doesn't that bring on flood blight for different areas? Um, insurance has always been a very difficult area. Mm. There has been agreement between government and, and the, the Association of British Insurers um, to provide flood insurance, but increasingly we're finding uh, from our stakeholders uh, that it can be more and more difficult to get flood insurance mm. and premiums in excesses are much higher. This film will be going out to people in the built environment, so that's planners, architects, um, builders and um, a whole range of stakeholders there. I wonder if you'd be kind enough to give us some advice on how to make our buildings and settlements more resilient to flooding events. Um, there is uh, there's lots of information on SEPA's uh, website uh, on both flood protection uh, and flood protection products mm -hmm. and on how to make your buildings more resilient. Um, the Scottish Flood Forum is doing a lot of good work there too in trying to educate people and raise awareness of flooding um, and flooding issues so that people are better informed and, and know what they can do. Is this the sort of flood liaison groups where you're getting all the stakeholders together in one community? The Scottish Flood Forum is, is a group to represent people who flood in effect in communities who flood right. um, and they're becoming quite active now in a number of areas and promoting um, local flood groups mm. so if you for example if you have small communities and it tends to work better in small communities um, which are at flood risk then the Scottish Flor Flood Forum have been uh, encouraging uh, groups to form so the self-help groups for example that will um, assist with uh, what to do in the event of a flood and how to reduce the flood damages and, and the like. Well, David, thank you very much for this fascinating talk, which we've gained a lot from. Okay. Really appreciate that. Thank you. This morning we looked with Murray Flood Prevention Programme at Engineered Ways of Preventing Flooding in Elgin. But now we're going to go with Gavin George and look at ways in which we can build protection at the level of individual buildings. So welcome, Gavin. Thanks for coming. My pleasure. My ignorance, perhaps, but I, I had not heard of Elgin up until about 10 years ago um, when I came into the flood protection industry. I then looked at a few facts, things like uh, the fact that it lost £100 million on one of its major, major floods. 
Um, and then I made a visit here and meeting with the people and seeing the amount of devastation in this city um, I found quite unbelievable. Great. This is a good point at which we actually go and look at how we can protect people and buildings from flooding. Anybody looking around Elgin would soon realise the extent of the flooding problem but also the extent of what has been done here several years ago. Paid for by council or by private owners, there's in excess of 400 properties here just with the flood guard systems alone, plus dozens and dozens more with, with other systems. And now we can go and visit one particular resident who has the system and look at it in detail. There are hundreds of businesses vulnerable to flooding. Sometimes it's not enough to rely on government or local authorities to provide your flood protection. Sometimes you have to take responsibility for your own, for, for your own assets. So this is an example of what can be done by a business, particularly a business who perhaps are, are seeing increases in their premium and excess for their insurance. It's a very simple approach. It's uh, blocking doorways. In this case, we're using a kite mark flood protection for the, for the front door and for the air bricks, um, which I'll give you a demonstration of now. The, um, the two, two elements. First of all, there's a back frame, which is fitted to the property. Um, normally to be as much as possible aesthetically in keeping with the property. And then secondly, there's a, a cover, a barrier, which is put, put in place at the time when a flood is uh, imminent or when there's a warning of a flood. Clearly, with this type of device, it does rely on some degree of warning or the property owner taking a fairly precautionary approach and having the defences in place um, prior to a flood coming along. So I'd like to, what I'd like to do now is to demonstrate how straightforward this particular system is. Now the aperture has been protected, should flood water come against that, that system, then it will not enter through that doorway. Now the doorways are protected and the same would be true for the other doors and for the air bricks. There's no guarantee that water will not enter. So this is where we need to look at other areas where the, the water might, might migrate into the internals of the building. So we could be looking at um, roots under the flooring, um, routes through the brickwork, uh, routes through the drainage. And all of these can be addressed, but it's not enough to have a barrier on its own on the doorway. It needs to be complemented with the additional measures. The ironic thing here is that despite you seeing air brick covers and door barriers, this property was not affected even in the worst floods of the last decade. The reason that the property owner invested in the flood guards is because they simply are situated in IV30. And that means that in most cases that the insurance deal is a not very good deal. Because these, this system is accredited, because it's kite marked, because it's been installed by professionals, it does mean that there is a, a positive response by insurers in most cases. In some cases it means you can get insurance cover when otherwise you wouldn't be able to get, get it. In, in most cases, it means a reduction to either the premium and or the excess. Sometimes protecting an individual property is not an option. This may be because of the excessive structural load imparted by a very deep flood. It could be because of the duration of the flood allowing water to permeate through other routes. In those cases, or sometimes because of the nature of the property itself, it may be appropriate to protect a whole site. This is an example here of protecting an entire site. After the flood of 2004, the business owner here made an insurance claim of one million pounds. Because of the, the extent of the claim and what was coming down the road in terms of the next insurance deal, the business owner decided that 
he had to provide his own protection again. In this case, it is on the perimeter. So it's a good example showing walls supported by embankments. And in this area here, the opening, we have final closure using our wrapper dam system. So the wrapper dam, which is normally um, rolled up as a membrane system stored in the, in the uh, workshop, will be brought to site, rolled out, bolted down, and in place within about five to 10 minutes. That will then provide protection for the perimeter, complemented by non-return valves, which protect the drainage from backflow, and also using sump pumps, so that water that falls within this area, or which would permeate up through the ground, can be evacuated to the, to the flooded side. So here's another example of insurance being the prime driver towards getting protection for the site. These properties are known as the war vets cottages and they're occupied by elderly, um, normally people from the time of the war. As you can see, they're all protected with floodguards. And the council in this case will come out and put the guards in place and evacuate the occupants. Mr McKenzie, yes. thank you for talking to us. Pleasure. You've told us that you flooded four times. Yep. Can you tell us what that's like? Well, it's difficult to tell. It's very traumatic. You know, I mean, uh, what's it like? I don't know. You can't really put it in words. It's just really devastating. You lose everything every time. And uh, three major floods, we've lost practically everything in the ground floor each time. And how long have you been out of your home for? Well, the longest, we're usually about uh, between uh, nine months and a year. You know, That's because renovation time. takes that long, drying it out, all this sort of the next thing, and then it's, uh, you know, it's, it's what it is. <laughs> I, mean, uh, I see you've taken some measures to try and protect yourself. Yeah. How, how effective were those? Virtually ineffective. They just don't work. I mean, even the council spent all the money on their properties, and it does exactly the same as the, the water comes in, whether you've got protection or not. Well, how does the water come in? Well, it comes up comes up up through the floors, through your access, you know, your water pipes, your drains, everything, it just comes up through there and I mean, there's no way you can stop that. In some cases, um, if, you, if you have a water coming through your floors, it's possible to pump um, the water away. Has that been... Well, that? I don't know if you could get pumps that would pump it out as quick as it's coming in. I, I mean, I'm, I'm not a, you know, I don't know that much about hydraulics and what, what you know, but, but uh, I don't know. We, we couldn't afford to install pumps anyway that would do that job. Right. Talking about cost, mm -hmm. well, you've had so much flooding here. What sort of implications has it been for your insurance? Well, at the moment, I'm paying £1,700 a year for insurance. And I mean, what, what can I say? I mean, we, we've tried to get insurance help, but nobody will look at us. So the company will be worth to keep us on if we'll pay the price that they ask. Okay. And at the moment, it's £1,700 a year. Now, the council's planning to protect this whole area. Yeah, yeah. Um, do the insurers not recognise that, that that's coming on stream? Well, as far as, as far as I can tell, the insurance just takes a block. Um, like, IV, this is IV30, right? And they say, well, we're not insured anybody in IV30. Unless, of course, you're, you know, live in the hills or something in you know, IV30. But in this area, they just, nobody will look at us. I have insurance, but as I say, it's cost me £1,700 a year. Best practice in some parts of the UK now is to have a su surveyor actually identify how water would enter your property yeah. and to actually identify what needs to be done. Yeah. In your case, that, that might typically suggest some pumps. It might suggest some reconstruction of the floor, especially if you, if you were to happen to flood again. Now, if that happens, w would you be in, a, be in a financial position to to invest again, or does the, the, no. the insurance premium and <laughs> other associated costs yeah. sort of preclude that? Well, I don't know the costs of it. I mean, uh, I've never really had uh, anybody look at it. if there's any way that we could really stop the water coming in here. But uh, I would assume that it would cost a lot of money, more than we could afford as pensioners. Right. You so know? if someone from the government or from local authority was to offer that, would, would that be something which would offer you some, some ray of light? Oh, yeah, of course. Any, any aid in not getting flooded, you know. But... Uh, I don't know. Uh, pumps may be the answer, but I can't see pumps being the answer where the water levels, you know, it's up about here. It, that, it, it's, it, it, the last flooding, it was over the wall. Right. Uh, that's all I can see, yeah. you know. That's and, but this, this, these 
little bit here seem to be the lowest buildings in the whole, uh, and um, the water actually doesn't come from the river, it comes down the roads from elsewhere. It's, the area doesn't flood here from the river, well it does flood from the river, but not actually busting its banks here, it's, uh, it's from further up by, yeah. the, by the cathedral sort of thing, it floods there and it just comes rushing down here, sits in this big hole here. You know, it's just a, it's bad design. Now, this is an old floodplain anyway, you know. Mm. And, and how do you feel about the, the council scheme that, that's well, they're delivering? Well, if, if it works, it's, it's a godsend if it works, you know. But uh, I don't know. I just couldn't really tell. It's very difficult. But, I mean, I dread getting in another flood. I mean, I'm 70 years old, you know what I mean? And uh, it's, it's it, it, I can't put it in words. Mm. And, and not, not another time, you know. Our traditional means of fighting flooding have been to build embankments or build walls, diverting watercourses, sometimes damming upstream. We're all of course familiar with the emergency measure which is the good old sandbag, perhaps a legacy of uh, World War I. But now floodguards have been around for more than 10 years, utilising the arch dam principle, lightweight plastic barriers, but is that really where technology will stop? I'm involved in an EU-funded project called Smartest, which looks at new technologies for flood protection. This will include automatic or passive systems. There are some systems which will rise out of the ground or flip up automatically. Great idea. You need to be aware about maintenance issues, about the risk of non-deployment, and also the fact that some people, even today, would prefer systems where they manually actually put them in place and have that that assuredness that, that they are sealed. Another thing that's coming to the market are flood doors. Flood doors um, as a concept are great because they're a passive means of protection. Um, you'd expect them to be normally in place rather than someone lugging a, a barrier in place. But they do have to be treated with caution. With a, a flood guard, for instance, and other demountables which are available today, if the water should go beyond two or three foot or whatever the height of the barrier, then it will enter the property and the depth of the water internally and externally will eventually equalise. With a flood door, there's a potential for protection to the full height. Should that happen, then there is a risk in extreme floods of excessive loadings on the property, which could cause structural damage um, and in the most severe cases, collapse, which obviously would not be welcome, particularly if there's occupants in the building. So there we're moving from the risk of property to the risk to life and limb. Another risk with flood doors also is the risk of someone actually opening the door um, unaware that there's perhaps two foot of flood water on the outside. If that should happen then the, the, the consequences don't bear thinking about. Many homes and industrial buildings will be demolished as part of the Elgin Flood Alleviation Scheme. For instance, all of these buildings will go as part of the Flood Alleviation Scheme. Sandy Reed's garage will remain. We're going to talk to Sandy now about his ideas about the future of the Elgin Scheme. Thank you, Sandy. Now, you've got Sandy Reed's garage next door. Um, could you tell us a little about the flooding history of this particular property? Uh, this building, uh, 2002, it was a big flood, but it never actually came into this building. Maybe lipping by about two inches, two inches higher than it would have come in. 2007 was it? The water everywhere was supposed to be a foot higher, and it came in here. Then, I think 2009, somewhere there, the water actually went past here, it didn't come in that time either. And, and how has that affected, for instance, insurance on this property? Well, we got insurance the last time. We might get insurance if we get flooded again, but that will definitely be the last. But we've also to find a fifteen, twenty-five thousand pound um, excess if we get flooded again. It's a lot of money. That is. And what about renting out this particular unit? Has that been more difficult? It has been difficult. I've got one, two, there's either two or three empty at the moment and have been for the last few years. Nobody wants to rent in case it gets flooded. 
And what are the plans? All those buildings behind you are going to get pulled down, but you're staying, are you? Mm -hmm. Aye. Aye, we're staying. We're the only building left on this side. And um, there's been some concerns that the height of the water every time seems to rise. What about uh, new developments in the floodplains? Is that uh, happening? Oh, well, they're still building the floodplains, but they're actually building some of the, the ground up, which is actually making things worse on this side, if we get any more flooding. And um, do you think that, have you actually asked your insurers and, and asked them if with all this new flood scheme, your premiums will go down? No, we, we, no, 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 we've never asked them that, no. And they haven't said, well, with the new flood scheme in place, you, it'll go down? They've never mentioned it, no, no. no. Right, well, um, in terms of the way forward, how do you, do you see, do you have confidence that this, you've obviously hoped the scheme will work? I mean, but do you, do I have confidence in it working? Yeah. No. Because the floodplains that they are building on are on the losses way out of Elgin. They are building the ground up or not land to build houses, they're planning hotels, industrial sites, Yards away from the river Bossy. And you've lived in Elgin for uh, many years too. For instance, the, the houses over the road, they flood too now, don't they? Yes, I have done for years. Aye. So, do, have you developed a, a plan of action or are you just putting your trust in God here? Uh, we'll just have to play along with whatever happens. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Sandy. Yeah, and good luck with it all. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we have Mike Donaghy here with us today, and he is an independent environmental consultant who's been instrumental in framing the Scottish flooding legislation. So thank you for coming, Mike. And could you tell us exactly what it is that the 2009 um, Flood Risk Management Act of Scotland actually does? Well, what it does is it empowers a, a wide range of people uh, to further protect the people in Scotland from severe floods. Um, there was always a group of people whose job it was to protect you from floods. What this act does now is in a sustainable, long-term way, working with other people at a catchment level, it brings everyone together, gets them talking to each other about how do we deal with this problem? And it also gives them even more tools in their toolbox to help them sort those problems out, take measures to cut down the flood risk to people and to property throughout Scotland. That's very interesting because going around Elgin, we've been talking to a lot of different people and some of them feel quite disconnected from the whole process. And um, this must, in a way, add to the fear that people experience because we've seen you know, people who who have really been fairly traumatised by the flood experiences that they've had. But how is it exactly we can achieve sustainable flood management? How do we achieve it? Well, we, there are lots of ways we can achieve it. When you mention the fear felt by people, that's, that's what it's about. It's about removing that fear. And the way you do that is by empowering people, by engaging with them, listening to them, finding out what they would like out of this whole process. So sustainable flood management works in a very straightforward way. It uses the catchment as your unit. So where does the flooding arise in the catchment? Where does it have its impact? What routes do the floods take to get to where they have their impact? What is or who are actually impacted? What can we do about that? And the tools start to appear. Things like better planning. Here's an idea. Don't build on the floodplain. Allow the river to expand and store itself into floodplains. That's all you can do with water. Either store it or move it through. But if you move it through and that's all you choose to do, you're simply moving the problem somewhere else. So allow the river space. And also, let's look at what planning laws allow us to build houses. 
so that we can keep away from areas where we put people at risk. And that brings in people like developers. Developers may see a piece of land and they think, oh great, that'd be fantastic to make some money from. Society can pick up the expense of protecting them from flooding. Well, developers and others have to look at their own responsibilities there. So how do you do sustainable flood management? At the catchment, looking at all the various components that make up the flood, who's involved, what professionals are involved, and get them all talking to each other about where houses go in, where the rivers need space, look upstream, what sort of land management is taking place that may actually add to the problem. So one of the components of sustainable flood management is natural flood management, but it's largely to do with land use. You know, have the trees all been removed? Um, have the bogs been drained? Um, have the streams been straightened? Could we start looking now at where we could re-meander rivers, restore wetlands and bogs, put in riparian trees that grow next to the river and slow it down whenever it floods, and start looking at the compensation schemes that could be paid to land managers to allow them to become involved in this. And that's what the Flood Risk Management Act actually does. Well, as design professionals, many of us have been taught that if you use sustainable urban drainage schemes like SUDS, then obviously the, the, we think that the problem might go away. But here in Elgin, they've actually decreed that they will not accept any more SUDS because, of course, SUDS schemes don't work in floodplains. And also, we're told if we build flood-resilient buildings, then it's OK to build on the floodplains. But the buildings we've seen show that there's no way any construction type could um, actually survive that severity of flooding. So what is it that building design professionals can actually do to alleviate flood risk? Well, before they do anything technical, what they have to do is realise their own responsibility for protecting the very people who will live in these buildings or work in them or use whatever structure you're going to be designing and building. So there's your responsibility to make sure you're not building or producing something which will effectively bring harm to people. The next thing is start talking to your other professionals about how you can make this all work. Ask, is this area or would a building put there be at flood risk? If it is going to be, you have to say, well, why are you putting it there? If it has got to go there, can we make sure people are fully aware of this? And can we do everything we can to make sure that people can live there with two main aims? No harm comes to them. And that if there is a flood, then they can recover from it very quickly. There's some confusion about who, who is actually liable if things flood. For instance, we know under, say, English law, Ashers versus Medway Homes, 1987, if a developer puts a development in the floodplain and it floods, the people can actually sue the developer because it's not fit for purpose. Um, here we've heard people saying, well, if this all goes ahead, for instance, in Elgin, and then we flood because they're frightened that that will happen, then we can sue Elgin for putting us in more danger. But, I mean, yeah. is there a legal recourse? Can people...? There is, but you would never want to get to that position. You would want to avoid that position. But let's just say you haven't avoided that position. Then if you can prove that the actions of someone else has led to you being flooded, then you're perfectly within the law to get recompense for that. However, it's a much, much better uh, position to take is to avoid it in the first place. That was one of the b basic tenets of the, the Scottish government's flood policy was avoidance. Let's see if we can just avoid having floods. So it, it's taking the longer view. It's not all about getting as many houses as quickly as possible onto the ground so people can make lots of money. It's about sustainable communities. It's about people living without fear within that catchment for a long, long time. Well, we've seen here in Elgin a number of houses. For instance, we interviewed Mr Mackenzie, and there's a few houses in that particular part of town. It seemed to be the most humane thing to pull them all down and move the, uh, those occupants to somewhere safe. I mean, is that a credible alternative? Of course it is. Um, 
I don't know the details of this and I don't know why they came to that decision, but that's actually not uncommon throughout the rest of the world where you look to see, right, is it, economically, is it worth actually doing this? Is the risk at which these people are living too high? So we just move away, just remove the risk, give the river back its space as a long-term solution and, try, and then look at providing homes within the, the community for the people who have been displaced. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think we've, before, we've seen a number of ways. We've seen the engineered solutions, we've seen the building level solutions, and now we're looking at almost natural flood management, which seems to be possibly, um, from a number of people we've spoken to, the way that the Scottish government's going, and it seems that that offers the most hope. Because there's one thing that sure people in Elgin know, you can't f fight a catastrophic flood. No, you can't. And the real hope is that the Scottish legislation is extremely advanced, it's modern legislation, and it already allows for natural flood management to make its contribution to the overall aims. Mike Donaghy, thank you very much indeed.